Welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Berdinsky, and somewhere soon on that split screen is Jason Zandri, Democratic Town Councilor. Jason, welcome back to the Citizen Mike Show. Ah, thanks for having me, Mike. So there's, a, there's some heavy stuff going on in uh, town council business, and um, one of the topics has to do with the possible transformation of that old train station. Uh, down to the foot of uh, the lower downtown. And this was on the council agenda, I understand, for Tuesday night, March 8. Um, just take us through what happened. Well, the EDC came forward with um, an outline of a plan and a grant that they wanted to apply for. Uh, it would allow for the, uh, the initial engineering, if you will, of the site and the grounds and, and basically getting the, the um, historical train station there um, brought back to like the, its, its original condition where it's like a shell ready for use. It's, it's right now utilized by, um, I believe, uh, you know, um, um, Adult Ed is using it. And I, I believe a, 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 train, a train group uses it as well, like a hobbyist group uh, on the weekends. So, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of different tenants in it, most predominantly Adult Ed. And this grant is supposed to get that shell ready for the next next thing that's going to do. So, as I understand the uh, presentation by the Economic Development Commission, is they're looking to transform this um, this old train station into something different, some sort of a commercial space. We'll get into details about that in a little bit. I have some language from uh, the specifications that went out to bid. But the bid um, was awarded to an architectural firm that uh, I gather is going to assume the burden of, you know, figuring out what design changes are needed, what structural changes are needed, cosmetic changes. Am I on the right track? Yeah, that's that's supposed to be all encompassing of, of the project plan, if you will. And so when it's when it's all said and done, um, I guess there's going to be a shell. Um, the outside envelope uh, would be spiffed up, refurbished as needed, inside walls that aren't structural, I guess, demolished, and it would be a big open space, and they would invite prospective tenants in uh, to... Yeah, I, I want to say that that station is on the historic registry of buildings, and I think they have to maintain, they have to, on, at least on the outside, they have to maintain a level of architecture that exists today. They can't change it a lot. Um, I believe there's a little bit more flexibility allowed inside. Okay. Um, and, and it's my understanding that that's, that's part of this effort, if you will. They, they want to bring something to that train station that might bring even more people downtown. You know, uh, some sort of, of, of regular activity beyond what's already there, like I said, adult ed, and, and then be able to utilize that, the parking behind the old brother's lot and so forth. All right, we'll get to that. So if you, if for the folks that watch the council meeting, it may appear that the architectural firm um, with, with the highest score got the bid, but that's not really true. Um, the the presenters, Economic Development Commission and the, and the uh, uh, Public Works um, Director were um, somewhat imprecise in their description as to uh, who won the bid. The, the, the architectural firm with the highest technical score, the firm that had the most expertise, the most experience, did the most projects, you know, had the highest quality score, did not get the bid. Um, the firm that got the bid got it only because their price was so low, like almost half of what the next highest bid was, that when you add the quality score and the and the score for the cost uh, involved um, the architectural firm was awarded the bid really based on the on the lowest price um, so what I mean I you know I, but it, when I saw the when I saw the bid numbers um, the firm that got the, the bid um, their price was 97,000 I'm rounding their bid was 97,000 and the next bid up was 183,000, you can see the difference. And when I first saw that, I said, whoa, someone really wants this job and maybe they put in a low ball bid. I, I just editorially say, I hope that doesn't reflect in quality down the road. Um, but that's not a cause for concern for anyone but me, I gather. Are you? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can only 
I don't want to call it second guessing. I mean, they, I mean, every time a bid goes out, I, I make the assumption, and even though I review what's there, that all of the different requirements for the town are followed. In other words, bid specifications are put out. Um, you know, they, they take a look at it from uh, purchasing. Purchasing is responsible for these things. So I have to imagine that all of these things are followed. Now, obviously, I, I when I look and see a disparity like that, I do the same thing. I look at it and go, gee, is there is there a particular reason that it's that broad? Are the other two just very high? Is, yeah. you know, are they not interested in coming? They bid high on purpose or or like what well, you're you're implying that somebody really wants it bad. So they're going to lowball in, in the hopes of, I don't know what, future work, something else. I have to I have to hope that with I mean, the EDC is more on the line than the council is, if you if you understand my my comment. Right. They're bringing this all forward. They want us to be agreeable to what they want to do if we vote that way. And then we have a disaster down there. Yeah, we approved it, but it's on them. They're the ones that are engaging on the project. So, yeah. I mean, you, I'm trying to have a little faith where I can on it. Yeah, um, I, I didn't mean to. Um, I, I didn't mean to go any further than I raised my eyebrows when, <laughs> uh, when I saw that. Um, so, and I think the purchasing department, frankly, does the same thing. Hey, how come? Two bidders are pretty close because uh, the, the top two in, in price, the most expensive bidders are pretty close in their bids. And then the third bid is, you know, about half. And you say, whoa, what's going on there anyway? Right. Um, based upon what has been publicly presented to you, either at the meeting or a prior meeting or emails that you get that we don't get, walk us through the step by step progress of this project what have they the town administration what have they said is going to happen next and then after that and then after that and if they haven't given you a you know the next step say so and then we can talk about it well i mean the the items that i review don't really map it out as well as you might as you're kind of describing it with like a phase one and a phase two i mean they're 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 almost presented in segments, right? They they're going to execute this work. Get they want to try to look into Manfredo Park there and the gazebo and everything surrounding the area, and not the parking lot itself, but everything is part of the park, including you know the sidewalk area, the outside of the building. Then they they basically talk about the elements inside with the um, cleaning up of everything and basically making it an an interior that's going to be. I don't want to call it attractive because I think it's going to be pretty empty. It's just going to be open and like, hey, give us your ideas of what we could put in here and invite people to do so. I think ultimately their end vision would be that there is going to be something in that like a hub or like a center where there's activity. I know that with respect to WCI, as an example, their, one of their charges downtown is to get a lot more of the, of the types of businesses into the downtown and uptown areas that are foot traffic inducers. In other words, they go, people go from one shop to the other. And I believe that EDC might partially be on that same page. They are looking for bigger pushes and bigger developments. And I think they're looking for this to be like a hub or a magnet that brings, you know, whatever is there, whatever it could be, would bring people down. And that's really the way they present it. Okay. So more like a vision than say a project plan. Yeah, that's too bad. Too bad it's not a project plan. So I don't mean to be indirect, but in a in a minute or two, I'm going to ask you why. But I'm not quite at the why question yet. But I want you to be prepared for the for the why why are we doing this question. So I'm going to put what you said kind of in my own words, and uh, if I go off the rails, you you stop me. So here's what they're not doing. They're not. Uh, advertising the train station through realtors or request proposal or whatever means that is commercially reasonable. They're not advertising it now to prospective tenants to say, hey, tenants or developers of buildings, come on down, look at the train station as is. And if you're interested in um, refitting this to suit your own purposes, um, that's fine. Let us know and give us a proposal on rent. 
And that way the town is not at risk for the money the town is gonna put into this. They're not doing it that way. They could do it that way. They could invite developers down and say, you know, uh, have at it any way you want to. Instead, I understand the town is um, going to apply for a 50% reimbursement grants. It is going to get these design changes all on paper, going to put it out to bid to contractors. And a number that was um, presented at the town council meeting was the cost of this demolition and hollowing out, shelling out of the building might be as high as 500,000 less the grant cost of the town 250. Now at that point, it was not stated, but I got a guess that there will be some sort of a promotion to find tenants and the town would now become a landlord. And there could be multiple leases, it's never been described. It could be one lease for the whole building that's never been discussed. The town becoming a landlord, collecting rent and jostling leases and maybe having to evict someone uh, was never discussed. The type of businesses they want um, it seems to be a food and beverage. Uh, at least that was in the documents as a possible. And then um, I guess eventually the town would negotiate leases, fill up the building, collect the rent, and everyone's happy. Yeah. So I just to kind of talk to the two points quick that I can remember because you, you you balled up a whole bunch of stuff there. I, yeah, so, I so. so I I don't know that they're not pushing the building today if, if it is it's it's more volume I, I don't hear a lot about it I mean yeah. I I hear more passive talk about what could go in the town slash old brothers parking lot before I hear anything about the train station and that might be partly because there's already people in it again adult ed you know um, I have to believe they socialize it at some low volume I I am going to be interested when we move as we move along to that other very point that you indicated about the town being a landlord because the administration has always indicated that that wasn't something they wanted to do right. and, and they've, said that over, they've said that over and over again anytime we've ever talked about you know buying property that became available and doing something with it that was always a, a main sticking point with the administration that the the town doesn't want to be in a position of being a landlord yeah. and it sounds like we're changing our tune here because we're not selling that train station to anybody. Right. Okay. So I think I, I think I got it. Um, so at some point there could be one or multiple uh, tenants. The use is unknown. That's not been, uh, not been discussed. And ideally when we add up all the rent checks and subtract all the other costs of maintaining a commercial property that whatever you know landlords have to do um it's never been discussed never been mentioned that the town would be making money on the deal that's undeniable you don't have to respond to that they've never said we're going to make money on it but i'm going to ask you to respond in a minute but i want you to fold in the board of ed so in your comments we're serving a rid of ejectment on the board of ed. They're out on the street. How do we fold them into this big picture, which we've never really gotten from the from anybody? Well, I think uh, again, I, I think that's where there's some pause with some of the counselors. I think I think adult debt is a very big concern for a number of us. I know it is for me. I, I have to agree with some of my fellow counselors on their concerns about the whole reason why. Um, adult ed works very well there is it is in the center of town it's kind of not that it's per perfectly equidistant everywhere in town but a, for a concentration of our residents they are downtown they are within one mile or a mile and a half of of that building and you can walk that in 30 minutes from most most of that concentrated area so that's a concern if it goes somewhere else if it goes out to where the board of ed offices are today on um Turbike Road there. So that's a concern. Now you're dealing with, with more space that Board of Ed has to rent. So we do have to look at this whole picture like you outlined. If we make you know $3,000 a month gross on one side, what is our output on the Board of Ed side if they have to expend more money in, in an additional lease area, if they can't repurpose parts of 
other buildings, which we used to do a long time ago. I think we used to have some of that up at Sheehan and it didn't work out over there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be looked at soup to nuts. And I would almost believe, and I'm speculating and spitballing a little bit here, that the ultimate argument could be, even if we're losing money, if we're break even or out a thousand dollars a month with all everything else in balance and something done with, with, you know, uh, adult ed, that the discussion point might be, but we've created a magnet downtown and it's going to draw in business. I could see it being sold like that. So I, would have to look at it and say, but is it worth the cost? So the, the, the question I'm gently pressing here with you, uh, not you personally, but generally speaking, we have a uh, controller, we have people working in the finance department, but primarily a, a economic development commission that is supposed to know business. And so I would think they think like businessmen, but this proves they don't. They don't. So if you're planning a real estate project, you want to know the net benefit of the net cost, uh, you know, the, your, your profit or surplus or your, or your net loss. And to go forward with a real estate project having no clue, no clue whether you're making money or losing money, or if you expect to make money, how much or lose money, expect how much. They have no idea what that is. They didn't present it to you. And I don't see how my personal view here, I'm off. I'm stepping down a little bit from the ledge. I don't know how this could go forward <laughs> without insisting on a financial spreadsheet. Tim Ryan, Joe Mira, go back to where you came and don't approach us again unless you've proven to us you've mapped the finances out and include in that a the cost of housing the Board of Ed. And if you don't include on that, we don't have a whole picture. And so your project is not worthy if we don't have the whole picture. So yeah, I, I, push back I, on you. No, no, no. I mean, I'm I'm kind of in agreement like that. I mean, I'm I've been receptive to what they brought forward, and yeah. I, I want us, I want to see us do something downtown. Yeah. Um, especially in that area, because we've been talking about cleaning up that area since we bought the brothers building, and it's yet to really happen over there. So, but I'm 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 going to start, you know, I my my concern is the fact that. If we're, we're going to set this up and it's not supposed to be a profit machine, then say so. It's going to be, I mean, right now we're, we're not expending any money, but we're not getting any money per se, not any real money by having adult ed there, but there isn't an added cost either by shipping them out somewhere else. So these things do need to be looked at. And, and then overall with the whole area, what, what else could it bring if we just developed on the brother's lot as opposed to this? So there's a lot of, I didn't want to muddy the waters as they brought their presentation forward, but these are questions that do need answers. So I'm, now I'm looking for the Jason Zandry plan. If you had ultimate power, the final word, a magic wand, what would be happening? Well, um, well, honestly, if I had a magic wand, I would have started four years ago with 50 South Main Street. I would have bought 50 South Main Street and I would have had Board of Ed in there. That would have saved us money on the leases that are, are over on, on Turnpike Road. At nighttime, when Board of Ed offices are not normally functioning, they may have meetings, we'd have more parking uptown because they would be at 50 South Main. The ship is might, well, I mean, uh, you, you're asking me, I would have had a, a longer plan. It wouldn't have been just this one thing. I, I would like to see us do something at the train station. I would rather have it be at, at, a, at a minimum a cooperative effort, right? If if we could get somebody that was like, almost like what you said, why not shop it right now? If somebody was going to bring in something that was going to be, uh, I'll use the example that you brought, you know, food and beverage. So let's say it's beverage, less food, more beverage, right? Then we could have food trucks out in Brothers Lot. We could be bringing, this way we've got a number of businesses being supported at once. The people that might be inside the facility and the people that might be outside. Then the concerns are always around people crossing the tracks and going on and on and on. But if I was going to do that, it would be comprehensive. It would take up the whole area. I would be thinking about other things we could be doing in conjunction and at the same time, not siloing in on one spot. So, but it doesn't look like it's it, so far. It doesn't look like it's it's going your way because um, you're dealt a different hand. 
Well, I mean, nothing that we try to do goes our way. The uptown paving didn't go. The, actually, the uptown paving went exactly the way I figured it was going to go. Wallace Avenue and, and the Wooden Kaplan probably still aren't paved. Yeah. And I've been fighting that for 12 years now. So I want to get back to the um, to the rationale for this. And we talked a little bit about money. Are we going to be are we going to be losing money on the deal? And I think based on what I see, without any help from the Economic Development Commission or the mayor of the Comptroller, we're definitely going to be losing money. So what's your tolerance for a loss? It is, how important is money to you? And you say, well, what's the trade-off? Well, the trade-off is, let's say, and this is now a reasonable inference, a refurbished train station with four different businesses in there, some of them you may like and some of them you may not like. It's what the market will bear, not what you choose. I would choose an Eastern Mountain Sports outlet for half of it, and my wife would choose a Talbot's, but that ain't happening. So you could get another pizza parlor, a tattoo parlor, another hair salon. I mean, you you know, you can hold out for a high-end steak restaurant and have it vacant for five years. Um, so it's all a compromise. I just want to take your temperature, your pulse. How important is it to you that this be a money-making deal? I think I don't want it to be a a huge drain on the town. Like, obviously I would want it to turn a profit. Let, let me start. Of course. Of course. Um, I mean, I mean, that's a reasonable expectation of anybody. You don't want to do anything and lose money, but I'm willing, I'm willing to tolerate a, a close to break even position where, you know, costs and again, balling everything up, even, even a, a minor level loss. If the trade-off is businesses are running, Taxes are being paid by those businesses. People are employed, and there are there is more gravity to other businesses. So, if if ultimately the town were losing fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year net on that area, but I I felt comfortable that there were twenty five or thirty added jobs there in totality between cleaning staff and people doing whatever they're doing in there, and there was opportunity for other businesses, like I said, like the food trucks or the fact that they're there, they might be patronizing folks that are in the other plaza or the stores that are over on lower center. I might be able to tolerate that small level of loss rather than not having any gravity down at that bottom of the hill. Well, you can't predict that. You can't control that. You can't plan that. Let me, let no, me. Would you ask me what my tolerance level would be? I know. Right, that yeah, I know. Yeah. I did. So I want to read something that's from a, uh, um, uh, the Economic Development Commission, I'm going to, and my question to you is, do you buy it? Do you buy it? Um, so they say in trying to pitch this, um, that the uh, historic building provides a unique opportunity to reinvigorate our lower downtown. And it goes on to say, we can remake our historic railroad station into a vibrant gathering place and the time to do it is now. So the glass half full, you might be one, this is my question, the glass half full is absolutely it's gonna reinvigorate, no question about it. We're gonna see in five years a transformation, a gentrification of that downtown, more customers, more foot traffic, you know, higher rents, uh, repairs and renovations being made. We're gonna see a vibrant gathering place in that, in that train station as people flock all times of day to clink, uh, toast their glasses, you know, and, uh, and, and, it's the, and it's the place to be seen. I'm exaggerating to make a point, obviously, the rhetorical tool I often use. Do you buy into that? I have concerns with it. And this is oh, why, because I see no. what goes on. Well, no, I do, because I, I have concerns okay. with it, because I, I see what goes into the stores on Center Street, and a lot of the businesses that are there that pay their rents close at five o'clock. So if we get the same types of businesses into that building, it won't do anything at nighttime for the restaurants yeah. because those types of businesses will close at five or six at night. So it would be my concern if we don't shop or market to the right people. So that, and that is actually glass half full because my concern would be, there would be so, there would be so much emphasis on let's get the rents filled. They're not going to stop to think about the person that's going to be open only Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and only part of Sunday. Which well, it's not going to do as much as as a business that would be there six or seven days during the week. Yeah. So uh, I, I need to bring this segment to the close. I'm going to take the next to the last word. I'll give you the last word because uh, we're going to 
of time. So my fear, my, my fear is after the town kicks out the board of ed and now has to pay rent someplace to house them, after we put in $250,000 uh, after the grant is taken into account, which is the only number we have to work with, um, the town now is, uh, I'm gonna use the word desperate to fill that building. And it fills that building uh, or, you know, there's turnover, there's occupancy, maybe there's some people that don't pay rent, we gotta kick them out and try again. But it puts people in that building and it's something less than vibrant and it, what results is something less than a reinvigoration. It's just another building with occupants, as it turns out. Um, it turns out to lose money and a ho-hum result with respect to a, a reinvigoration. I say it ain't worth the risk. Do you agree or disagree based on what you know now? Well, my feelings are I, I would have to disagree with that because I, I think uh, because I think without without risk there's no I, I can guarantee that nothing if, if i don't swing i'm not gonna hit the ball i yeah. might swing and miss it anyway but at least i took a swing now you can't just keep doing that open-ended but i'd like to see us try to do something as yeah. opposed to, to nothing there yeah so oh, I, I, I think it's a calculated risk and i'd like to see where we might be able to go with it so that's not quite the final word. I still will give you the final word. So I, I would have preferred to manage the risk. Um, and maybe, maybe I'm not sure about this grant, but to market the property now to see who's, who could come in, a single developer to come in and they assume the risk of the renovations. They assume the risk of the occupancy and we don't stand to lose that, you know, the money that we've invested and we don't do anything until we have a home for the board of ed. I mean, you know, at least in place, and, um, and I should have added this because it's kind of important. I'm a little bit afraid that the interests of the Economic Development Commission trump the interests of the Board of Ed. And Tim Ryan and his colleagues convinced the town, convinced the council, convinced everyone that adult ed, well, they could go someplace a little farther out. Don't we want to reinvigorate our downtown? And that the interests of the adult ed students and the adult ed program are sacrificed for this project that has a lot of speculation, you know, baked into it. Now you do have the final word. Okay. I, I would, I have never asked and I probably should have. And, and when this comes back, I will, I, I have been under an assumption that as they talk to different developers about what things could be done on, on the brothers parking lot, that they are also mentioning the train station. Hey, this whole thing could be, this whole parcel plus that building we could do different things i i would believe they would talk about it all as two different segments and one great big thing maybe they're not but i think i need to ask them now because that maybe was a bad assumption by me if if i'm just assuming they did and they never did and if not then maybe they should and because there might be someone that's got a better idea and they're just looking for a place let's change the subject much as i hate to Get away from this because I could talk about this for a long time, but <laughs> let's get away uh, from this and, and go to the topic, which is the gift that keeps on giving, and that's ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, Wallingford has $13 million and it has a wonderful problem. They're struggling on figuring out how to get rid of that money. Um, you know, different approaches, different thoughts, different thinking. But before we get to specific developments and, and what's happened, there's some context, I think, uh, that I want to add, and, you know, we prepare for these shows, and I know you have, it's data uh, about what kind of federal money has gone to Wallingford before today. Um, and that comes from uh, money the federal government gave to Wallingford via the Paycheck Protection Plan. Um, there are databases out there that folks can look at that shows the name of the business, and how much money they got, and if it was a loan, whether it's forgiven, and almost all the loans were forgiven, there may be a few that are that are still outstanding. Um, so far, based on the database I looked at, there were 1,460 recipients in Wallingford that got paycheck protection money. Jason, what have you found? In so I, I I found that same database, and what I, what I did was I did a full data poll, and what I didn't realize when I did it is that it was limited to 500 rows because of the way that I pulled all the data. Because I pulled all of the 
the businesses, the locations, all the hyperlinks and everything. So when I got down to 500 rows, I thought that was the end of it. And actually what it was, was the final, the final recipient that I have on my list was a $54,000 um, PPP loan. So my list is, is absent everybody under $54,000. So I've got 54,000 and higher. And those 500 um, businesses that I've got pulled have 143,500,000 in change. Wait a minute. Slowly repeat it with emphasis. Okay. What? What? 143,500,000 are the top 500 businesses that received funds. That's the amount. We, you've explained how you short counted it, um, but that's the amount already in the hands of Wallingford businesses. Yeah, they've had it for whatever period. Most most of them, uh, all this was the original PPP. There's other there's other programs that have been out there. This is the original one. Okay, so some fun facts that um, I came up with uh, using that uh, I believe the same database. First, I want to. Um, Pick on the lawyers. That's okay. They got from Paycheck Protection Plan in the aggregate, and there's a bunch of lawyers, a lot of rows, $1,252,793. To the lawyers, they're small businesses. Lawyers are small businesses. You know, as our architects, orthopedic doctors, eye doctors, dentists, and they're all good. okay. Full service restaurants, um, because we hear a lot about how the restaurants are struggling, they already got $6,276,542 from the Paycheck uh, Protection uh, Plan. Now, those are the full service restaurants, but in addition, there's limited service restaurants. I think it's restaurants where you walk up to the counter, order a pizza or a Subway or a, you know, a deli sandwich or something like that. And they all already got one million eight hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred and eight thousand dollars. So there's been a lot of money from the federal government into Wallingford businesses so far. And finally, beauty salons. They got in the aggregate one million six hundred seventy-six thousand dollars. So that's the context. And now we have. Um, 13 million additional dollars based upon public statements, you know, presentations made to you or emails or documents that you received in your official capacity as a town councilor. Describe to the extent you know it, what the overall game plan is for setting up our Wallingford's distribution program to get rid of the money from beginning to end. And if there are gaps, let us know. So we've got a, we've got a, um, subcommittee of the town council there's five members of us that that are trying to work this out right now there's there's a the firm that the town has hired as a consultant to handle the distribution of the the fun, I mean, the i don't want to necessarily say the distribution of funds but doing all the back work you know putting together the applications the process they're the ones that are going to do the management and the screening and then bring it forward to the town for acceptance or rejection um I think my my bigger concern with all of that is I don't mind that activity occurring and having it work in parallel, but we have to make a decision what we're even going to do. What if we're not going to give, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be collecting applications if we're not going to give it to small business owners or residents or, or nonprofits, if we're all going to do things that are, you know, a municipal oriented, in other words, infrastructure or whatever the case might be. So it's it's kind of like a chicken and the egg type scenario where we're still making up our minds what to do and they're creating an application process for elements we may not serve ultimately. So this is why some of the discussion at the last meeting basically was fine if we're if we're not going to make a hard decision on whether or not we you know do all non sum or one that we should chunk out a piece of it and counselor uh on balance and basis said why not three million dollars she kind of spitballed three million i made the suggestion of saying okay if we do that then let's make it a million for small businesses uh a million for um non and and a million for 
the the you know residential help, help with taxes, help with electric, help with rent, whatever the case might be. And we've got that other 10 million to consider for municipal projects, or we could start chunking it in if there's a there's this huge demand for rent relief or whatever the case might be. But it, it kind of was a way to start with a subdivision, if you will. And that's kind of where we are right now. I want to back up and review a little bit for the for our viewers that missed some shows. It's hard to imagine that anyone we're so fascinating here. But Wallingford has 13 million uh, from the federal government. The first 10 million can be used for just about any purpose, any government purpose, any uh, way we have traditionally spent money, uh, any programs we could use 10 million for. That opens the door you know, wide open for the use. And the other 3 million has to be somehow related to the mitigation of the effects of COVID. Um, but that that has been liberally interpreted. So that's sort of the background. And now we we have to figure out where the money is, um, uh, where the money is going to go. Um, you mentioned, um, I think, um, applications for this money. That the notion is potential recipients for the cash would fill out a form. It would go somewhere. Someone would decide it based on some criteria in some time frame and at some point a check would be mailed and that's kind of all we know i i think um and there were some speeches made at the last council meeting that there's a lot of struggling businesses help them now am i did i imagine that was that part of the pitch yeah, so that's, that's definitely been one of the defenses made on why this this money was this money was granted based upon the negative effects of COVID, the fact yeah. that the government shut businesses down, and and that's where the focus should be. The 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 suggestion that I received, I don't know what was said. I guess I better you know, but the suggestion I got: these are struggling businesses; they needed to keep going. You know, let's not forget them. Um. And I look at the application that was presented to you guys, and there is absolutely no information or no requirement or no criteria that those businesses be struggling. Yet, I, I remember someone from the EDC, whether it was Tim Ryan or Joe Mira, made the suggestion, these are small businesses, they're your neighbors, don't turn your back on them, they're struggling, but it's not in the paperwork, therefore, a business that made 4,000 before COVID, sorry, 4 million before COVID, but only 3 million during COVID, not struggling at all. The owner is well-to-do, always will be. They're as eligible for that extra million dollars as the deli that may go from month to month. So the rhetoric pitched by the Economic Development Commission doesn't match the paperwork. And whoever um, you know comes to the microphone and says people are struggling, they need the money. It's not in the application that that they prove that they're struggling. I'm going to read you what is in the application. I, it's so vague. I don't. I don't even know what it means. Um, the um, application also is uh, in the process as described so far, doesn't require verification by the applicant for money, doesn't require documentation to support the claim. Uh, and we've kind of announced that we're not gonna verify. I think the mayor said at a public meeting, we don't have staff to verify. Uh, they're gonna sign it under oath and that's enough of a protection while I've heard is complying with the law. So putting all this together and frankly preparing for the show, I kind of, this reminds me of um, the Great Recession 2007, 2008, and the liar loans. Oh no, Mike, that's a little harsh, isn't it? Wallingford would never do that. Those liar loans, you know, didn't require verification of the property's value. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're asking businesses and others to fill out forms, and we're supposed to trust them, and they're not required 
to provide verification in the way of audited financial statements, tax returns, or any other documentation. They self-declare. And if they claim they had a loss, even though, even though they're rich and they're wealthy and they're not struggling, they had a loss, that is given full weight alongside of maybe someone who is struggling. I'm going to stop because I'm going to refer to some language, put it back to you. And have I gone too far off the cliff here? I mean, what's, well, I have my causes and I pitch them on the show. What can I tell you? <laughs> did, did you want me to jump in here? Did you want jump to jump in here? Me? Jump in here. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with your sentiment and that's part of my concern. Self-attestation bothers me because anybody, anybody can, can say, listen, I'll sign the document that I made last less money during the pandemic and, and maybe I did but the but the the problem becomes just like you outlined even even in my job or if I had my business still and you know I might have made less money I've gotten past that now I've either struggled through it I've made myself whole or I've you know gotten into the situation where I'm 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 used to not making that extra money anymore and I'm moving forward and whatever the case might be that is very very different than someone whose lights are about to go off right yeah. So it's going to be hard if we're not getting this information. And like the point that you made, if, if there's no financial documents, you know, the audited financials that, that an accountant would output and someone would file their taxes against, if we can't review them and give, give the applicant a thumbs up or thumbs down, we're just taking a guess. Yeah. We're just taking a guess that they were impacted and we, we need to, and we also don't know a lot of other factors. A business might have used to run a particular way. They might have run six days a week and they might have run 12 hours and they may have reduced that during that period. There, there was a definite shutdown period, but then when the period came back online, anything could be made as an argument. Well, we didn't have the staff because people were staying home because of COVID, their kids were home. How much of that is because of the government and how much is that because it just happened. Maybe people moved away from getting hamburgers and started buying hot dogs. You can't, you can't make an assumption on every little thing. So it's going to be very difficult to scrutinize all. This is why a lot of the discussion is going around. Maybe we should lean pretty heavy on the municipal project side at that $10 million bucket and still afford the $3 million and let those three divisions shim out and work with it. Uh, I think that I think that's a very strong, very strong point. Um, I want to. I have a couple other points that I when when you're done. I mean, no, get to those points now because I can go. So, right? so I'm 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 kind of coalescing around the idea of keeping the ten million for the town, and we maybe we break little pieces off and refill those other three buckets. But I do want to do something for the small businesses and have you know again maybe it's that million dollar mark. Maybe there are businesses that could have if they could get. 500 bucks or or a thousand bucks and get caught up on their electric bill they can move forward and maybe there are some residents that if they could just get caught up on their arrears they've tried they've tried uh unite ct they didn't get through the program because of something some somebody in the household worked too much and they fell outside that program and they're just behind a month and a half and if they could get a thousand dollars they could be whole too so i'm not opposed to trying to do that but I also want to see where the, where the nonprofits come into play with that you know, million dollar ish bucket. They've got some ideas. They've got some ideas on how, how we might be able to do more with this, be able to implement a plan or a project that they, that they need funding for that might allow for reskilling of the adults that, that might want to come in and do other, other jobs now they've been displaced out of work or the ability to have um, support for childcare while they're working. If they're working till five and childcare ends at four, that gap space, if they've got programs that they could work with, SCOW and Albert Boys and Girls Club, as part of a whole project plan put together to help people can you know work a full day and then allow them to pay their own bills. I'd like to see those too. So I'm not opposed to kind of keeping it broad, but I, I definitely want to see us looking at something we can control better, which is the municipal side of it. We know what we need. I'm not opposed to some of these other things where we might be able to help. But I, if I'm going to do anything, and I've said this before, 
And this is why I kind of leaned on the nonprofit thing. If they've got this awesome project that they might be able to implement that might help people feed themselves and do better at their job or get a promotion or help with resumes or whatever it might be to help empower people to do more. That's really where I'd rather be focusing some of this other money to. Yeah. Um, uh, Maria Harlow uh, from the American Wallingford um, United Way makes a compelling case for putting money into um, up training, um, skills upgrades um, for, for workers. And, um, and maybe if they have to go to a school or go to an internship, the childcare uh, piece, you know, someone has to watch their kids, maybe that comes into it too. And if money is put in that direction, and I'm, I'm gonna set my goals modestly here, if you can change 25 lives, by giving someone who was underskilled new skills so they could find you know, a much better job. That legacy goes on and on and on rather than giving it away um, to, 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 uh, to a, a recipient and there is no you know, legacy net benefit. I wanna recap something I said uh, or some things that I said. So the applications that they now stand, as they now stand, requires no documentation, there's no means testing uh, there. The rich guys can get uh, a lot of money. We've already told them, you know, we're not going to try to verify your statement by going to databases uh, because the mayor said we don't have um, the staff to do that, although we could. We could hire an accounting firm. We could hire consultants and, and use the ARPA money to verify. And that would probably more than pay for itself in the less wasted money. But also in the applications that they now stand, you don't really have to show a loss. You show a revenue dip, a revenue reduction doesn't always translate to a loss, which is something that you, I think, suggested a little bit, uh, you know, a few minutes ago. You can reduce your expenses and you can have a larger profit uh, by reducing your expenses, even though you may have had a revenue, a revenue drop. So certainly you, you need to widen your, your scrutiny beyond just revenue uh, comparisons. Um, Here's some language from the application that I couldn't figure out, but I, but it's just me. So it says that for business eligibility, they have to be able to demonstrate whatever that is, a written statement, they just write it out. Right. They have been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and that grant funds will enable the business to continue to operate and become stronger. So I say uh, I have a business and it's doing quite well, but another 100,000 would enable it to continue and be stronger. I'd have it added to my operating funds account and I've qualified. Now, not all businesses are the same and, and some I may, you know, some are, some are stronger to begin with, some are weaker to begin with, some are on the way out of business anyway because they never had a strong you know, business model, the stability of these, some of these businesses may be in question. So now we say, well, who's deciding these applications? Who is it that is qualified to look at the data sparse as it is and to rank the businesses as to their worthiness based on the application? We don't have an answer to that, do we? Well, my understanding and um, subject, subject to subject to error, oh. was that the consultant was supposed to be doing this work. They were supposed to go through the process and then forward to the administration the ones that passed muster. That's the way that it was described to me. Nope. nope. What, what I think the consultants said was that they'll find out which ones are eligible and which ones aren't. So if someone didn't pay their taxes, you know, they'll throw that in, in another pile. If someone didn't fill out the proper blank, they'll put it in another pile. But one business's case may be more compelling than the next, but both could qualify. But that doesn't mean each business should get the amount they ask for. And someone has to make that judgment. I go back to Peachtree Corners, uh, Peachtree Corners, Georgia, and they were scoring these application on strength and weaknesses and worthiness, not eligibility. Eligibility, they're nothing, but some businesses may be more worthy than others. That, that business that made 3 million instead of 4 million may be ranked a lot lower than some business that's really in danger of going out of business and 100 grand could save them. It's the scoring and the ranking that bothers me. And 
we're beginning to 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 uh, to wind down a, a little bit. Um, there's a technology piece I want to run by you that I don't think has been discussed, but Peachtree Corners and very instructive talking to the guys from Peachtree Corners and how they implemented their ARPA plan. They took great advantage of technology um, to uh, manage the grants and to keep track and, and to actually publicize how much money was going out the door and to whom. It added transparency and it also allowed the grant managers to keep oversight and for reporting purposes. That has never been talked about at the council level. Um, the the, the um, consultant has that ability, but no one has ever pinned him down. He's on a per hour rate. The mayor could say, no, you're not doing that. We're not gonna pay for that. We'll, we'll do it in house. I mean, that's never been asked. Your thoughts on my concerns. Well, I mean, as with anything else that's technology based, the, the mayor is not going to make an investment in it. And whether whether it's installing it themselves or leveraging it through somebody else. And I and I, and I didn't even bring it up because I didn't want to waste my time because <laughs> I, because I, because I didn't. I, I've been fighting this battle for 20 years. Mike, you've been around a long time. I've been bringing up technology regularly yeah. and uh, uh, it's we could do this. We'd have the ability to track everything. If we put contingencies in place, if someone applied and got a grant for $50,000, but we asked, we said, look, we're going to give you $10,000. We want to see you spend it in this manner. As you execute it across the business, the way that you've outlined, we'll give you the next installment and we've reserved the right to pull it back in X, Y, and Z. Everybody makes it sound like it's super complicated. It's like two mouse clicks and a toggle. And that's it. And you could keep wonderful trade. It's not micromanagement. It's outline, it's project plan, it's spend. It's just like it's like a loan from the bank, a construction loan or business loan. When you're ready to deploy phase one, we'll give you so much. When you're ready to deploy phase two, we'll give you so much. When you're all done with and you're ready to start phase three, we'll give you the rest. Oh, you're not going to do phase three? Well, we won't give it to you, but we gave you the other two. Go ahead and operate that part of the business and pay that part of the loan back. Now, that's a loan. But I mean, a grant would be the same thing. You've got pieces to the puzzle. These, these things are looking like, hey, there's a hole in my returns from 2020. Can you guys help me backfill my hole? And that's what I don't want to have. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm looking for is, is not some decision on applications. That's starting the ball game like in the seventh or eighth inning. Uh, is to go back to the beginning and, and get an overview, an honest and frank overview from somebody, apparently not the mayor. So the council may have to devise this on their own, which is an impossible task probably. But I'm looking for an overview starting from the beginning, you know, the outreach to all residents, all businesses, all nonprofits. Um, how's that going to look like? Do you put it in the newspapers, put it on the website, put it in the utility bills, put it on social media? How, how do people get the word on a level playing field basis? That comes first never been explained, never been a commitment to that. In fact, the mayor is undermining that by having or asking you guys to approve applications before the word is out, you know, in a thorough and, and fair way. Let me, let me just quickly run through this. The technology piece we just discussed, that's never been nailed down and said, you know, the mayor of the administration never, never told you guys, town council, don't worry. We're going to get software as needed to effectively manage it if we have to you know, buy it off the shelf or make it proprietary. We will have this. We will have the software to allow people to go online, fill in their applications online, upload those tax returns online, and then monitor how the payments are going so the public and press can do that. We're, we got you covered. We know your concerns. Um, the criteria on scoring, never been talked about, never been discussed by the administration or, or the council. Um, by the way, the freedom of information aspects you know, if a panel is going to decide and is, is that a subcommittee and are meetings open in Bridgeport, they are. There's a panel discussing, bringing in uh, nonprofits, for example, to interview them, bringing in businesses to interview them with their application to have them explain that's open to the public and there's minutes. Um, and in the, in the absence of these details, I you know, maybe then you can say, okay, you know, 10, 10 million for public projects and we divide up the rest. I, I, I don't, I don't know, but uh, we are running out of time. So now you get the final two minutes on 
that or anything else. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a whole lot more that I can say about it, only because yeah. it's so convoluted. And, you know, like everything that we do, we do it very late. We do it very slow and, and we don't do it very efficiently. Um, you know, and I and I don't know. I, I really I'm struggling with trying to to figure out the best way to approach it, because, again, it's very important. It's definitely once in a lifetime money that we're going to get. And there's so many different opinions on what it's supposed to be used for that everybody forgets that it's it's not going to be a, a level decision. There's going to be people, people, there are people that already went out of business. Not only did they go out of business, they went back to work somewhere else and they're they're going to take five years to get whole again. And they're completely discounted. They can't even apply for any money. So there, there are a lot of factors that, that people are overlooking. And, and then we, we're at a disadvantage because of our position on technology, our position on, on making this transparent. I mean, look, you and I both went and pulled all that PPP information. It took us, we had to find a website. We had to find where to go. It took us maybe a little while to find it on a search engine. But once there, we could pull everything and sort it and do all kinds of stuff. I'm sure that it's going to cost me 50 cents a copy to get stuff photographed, you know, photocopied on the copiers if I want to FOI it. And we're just not, we're not up to this task. And then we hire a consultant, like you said, hourly, and they're only going to do what the administration asks them to do. Short answer to this next one. Tom Laffin at the last council meeting made a report from the ARPA subcommittee and he said, there's some sort of legal opinion that's work in progress that is supposed to further define the role of the council. Um, is this an attempt by the law department to end run the council? I hope not, because I'll push back on that pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's make that the final word. Jason Zandri, thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. Time flew, uh, and, and we appreciate you coming back. And uh, hope to see you back on another episode of the Citizen Mike Show. And thank you, viewers, for uh, for watching. We thank WPAA for putting the Citizen Mike Show up uh, on their channel, nine o'clock on weekdays. Good night, everybody. Good night, Jason. Thanks again. Thanks a lot.